Well, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Zinkle Esamwa. I'm a host and correspondent here at Now This News. Today's interview is hosted by Futures Without Violence, a leading national organization that has been at the forefront of policy, program, and culture change to end violence against women and children for more than 30 years. And they're sponsoring the Domestic Violence Response Fund launched in 2020 in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, I'm speaking with Kaveta Mera, who is a recipient of the Domestic Violence Response Fund grant and the executive director of Saki for South Asian Women. Kaveta, thanks so much for speaking with me today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so just to start, can you share with us who you are, what you do, and why you do it? Uh, so I am the executive director of Seki for South Asian Women, and we work with survivors of gender-based violence here in New York City who represent the South Asian diaspora. And this work is deeply meaningful for me because I know that my life would have been fundamentally better had Seki been in it. And I think about the survivors that we work with, both youth and adult survivors, um, and how transformative the work that we do is for them. Yeah, and Kaveta, something that stuck out to me was the name of your organization, Saki. Can you talk to us about what that name means and its relevancy? Saki is the Hindi word for friend, for women friend. And what we often think about is building community. It's rooted very much in thinking about how survivors need community through their healing journey. And over the course of 31 years, we've been able to do that. We're the second oldest South Asian women's organization in the country and have really established ourselves in breaking those barriers that gender-based violence is a pervasive issue in our community um, and want to continue to do with that. Uh, the healing process is not a linear journey. And when we think about what healing looks like for a survivor of trauma, while accessing um, the court system and accessing mental health are really important and also accessing um, immigration support, are critical in order to finding safety in the course of one's life. One cannot sur survive or even thrive from uh, in, at any point in their life if they don't have a roof over their head, if they don't have food in their stomach, or if they don't have enough money to pay their bills. Absolutely, and I think a lot of the needs you identify, I can only imagine, have been heightened under the COVID-19 pandemic. I know in the world of media and news, we've seen a lot of headlines around domestic violence increasing, uh, not just in the U.S., but worldwide. Can you speak about how the need has been in this year of the pandemic and how COVID has impacted your work? It was clear to us that survivors were in very difficult circumstances. They were being pressured to bring those who were inflicting harm back into their home. Um, orders of protection were being violated. But what was also coming up was that um, survivors were facing a great deal of anxiety and fear around the economic calamity that's happening in the midst of this moment. There's a mother that uh, we work with who was experiencing forms of extreme sexual violence uh, through the course of the pandemic, and she was pregnant at the time. And um, while she was continuing to experience that form of violence, she had identified a safe place for her to live um, and to move from New York into New Jersey. What Saki was offering was private transportation for her to move um, so that she could live free from violence. She was so afraid of exposing herself or her children to the pandemic that she decided not to take on that opportunity of private transportation, but continue to live with forms of extreme violence, at least in the, the height of the pandemic. By the, end of, by the summer, she was able to move. But those months of March and April, she was seeing that heightened form of violence because she was living in such fear of the pandemic. To me, that had indicated that that was a necessary measure for us to be able to step up in this moment to think about the fact that our community was facing great circumstances and that we needed to be there to demonstrate support. What can people do? I think some people hear this and many of they hear about the work that you do and it can be overwhelming or defeating or feel grim. What can people do who want to get involved and support? If you know someone who's experiencing harm, just know leaving is always an option. And for those who want to learn more about how to support survivors in your local community, um, think about, you know, how your, your impact, your, your volunteerism, your donations can make a transformative change. And something that, you know, is really important is we're talking about calls for courage right now. And calls for courage look, look like stepping up for your community, investing in your community, and, and something that um, you have the power to do. Um, our actions have a ripple 
effect and can create transformative change and just keep that at the forefront of your mind. And I, I want to make sure that those watching have a sense of what kind of impact funds and contributions to organizations like yours have. Can you speak to the difference it makes when your organization receives funding from places like the Domestic Violence Response Fund? How does that directly help survivors in the work that you do? It's transformative. I think when we think about demonstrable gifts like this, um, it can help underwrite housing for a survivor and her family. And the number one thing when we think about healing, what's linked to it is stability. We can't build stability and we can't offer up stability, especially economic stability, without resources and funds. It's funds like this that allow us to do the work that we do. That's amazing. And I think it's powerful that it's like a community supporting a community. Uh, and that's what movements often are built of. And I'd love, I always like to end interviews letting folks end with any final thoughts or food for thought that you want to leave us with. Is there anything you want to be sure to say before we end this conversation? There are a lot of lessons from 2020. And I think all of us can recognize that this has been a moment that has taught us um, at a personal level and a professional level, how we can get through this. And um, I think many of us are holding on to what 2021 has to bring. Absolutely. I know I certainly am. And I look forward to continuing to follow your work. So thank you so much. This has been a conversation with Kaveta Mera. She's the executive director uh, at Saki for South Asian Women. Thank you so much for all of your time and your work. Thank you.